So let's get started. Oops. Yeah. So in terms of the agenda, uh, I'll talk about what a pattern is. Patterns usually are boring, so I'll try to make it interesting. Right. Then we'll basically talk about various architectural patterns. And, and, and there are various categories of these architectural patterns. Right? Uh, Professor Frank Lehman talked about certain patterns. Uh, they have a cloud computing pattern catalog as well. There is the gang of four patterns. There is the POSA patterns. patterns. There is the TOGAF framework and the, the Zachman framework. So there's, there's many patterns and many levels and categories of where these patterns fit in as well. So you've got your design patterns, you, you've got your architectural patterns, you've got your enterprise architecture patterns. So there's no clear separation of these patterns, right? It's basically, once you become an architect, it, it's a matter of gut feeling, it's a matter of experience, expertise, specialization, and basically being able to apply the right pattern in there. So we look at seven categories of patterns. Uh, those patterns are listed there. And, and then we'll, we'll see how each pattern adds in and what the advantages are of each pattern. Right. So what is a pattern? A pattern basically, so you, as you know, all of you are architects, software engineers, you're from technical background or, or non-technical background, but you dealt with projects, right? Each project has its fair share of problems. Each project basically helps you learn stuff. You, you get best practices, and then you use those best practices. So, Two separate projects are not the same. The challenges are not the same. The solutions are not the same. And the technology is not the same. But you get certain challenges which you solve, which can then be applied to various other projects as well. So you, you get these best practices. You get this catalog of best practices, which can be applied uh, for various projects or various scenarios. So that's a pattern, right? So you've got patterns everywhere. And in software architecture or in software development, you've got certain concepts that you can reapply, right? So, so that's a pattern. So let's look at, an exam look at an example. So pattern is usually a boring thing, right? So uh, there is this pattern that uh, Christoph Alexander uses as an example of a bed alcove, right? So, so basically, do you need a bedroom, right? Uh, so all of you have bedrooms, hopefully, uh, unlike, unless you are living in a tent like me. So I'm moving to the US next week, so I've packed up all my stuff. So I'm literally living in a tent. So that means I don't have a bedroom. But uh, so there's this, there's this analogy that you don't need bedrooms, right? So why? So you've got a design problem which says a bedroom makes no sense, right? Uh, unless you're newly married, right? OK. So, so then what are the forces there, right? First, the bed basically takes up a center space, right? You, you have a bedroom. The bed basically takes up center space. Then you try to figure out what goes where. So then the wife comes and says, I need a mirror here. I need a full length mirror here. I need a dressing table here and all of that, right? And I need a sofa here, right? So, so you, you model your room around that bedroom, right? So, so you, then, then basically the wife comes and says, no, the master bedroom in the house is not same or similar to the visitor's bedroom. So the master bedroom needs to have an attached toilet. The master bedroom needs to be really big, really spacious. And I need to put this really queen or king size bed for just the two of us, right? So we're not plan planning to have kids as well, right? So, so you got this massive bed in this massive room, and then you got these pockets of space around it, and you need to go and put in your things there, right? So, so that's, that's the design problem. And you got the forces, and the husband is the force, right? He comes and says, why do you need so much space? Why do you need this, this pocket of space? Why do you need to put in something there to fill that pocket of space, which you created in the first place, right? So the solution there, and this is Christopher Alexander, this is not me, basically is to build a room around your bed. A bed basically fits in a place where it fits naturally. So why not, instead of building a bedroom, uh, have something called an alcove. So an alcove is a small area which is part of a certain room. right? So, so kind of like you have a, a, a sitting area, and you have an alcove, and you put a bed in there. Right? So why not have an alcove, size of the bed, uh, put the bed in there. Right? So something like this. You can see you've got your sitting area, you got all the other stuff, and then you have a small space, and you put your bed in there. Right? So that's the pattern. That's the solution to the pattern. So that's my pattern. Now, with that pattern, you got related patterns. right? You got com communal sleeping. Uh, newly married, that's a different kind of pattern. right? You got a marriage bed. You got the ceiling height pattern. What do you do for the ceiling height? Do you need a, a chandelier over your bed or not? Right? 
you, you have the half open room, you have the thick walls pattern, right? In, in, in our master bedrooms, we want thick, thicker walls than the thinner walls, right? Um, and what's this anti-pattern? So the bedside arguments, you can't have those anymore, right? So that's your anti-pattern when you go with this. So this is a typical pattern. We had a design problem, we had forces, Everyone faces these problems, as, as especially as the guys in Sri Lanka, we face these problems, right? We have to build a master bedroom, which is the, one of the largest rooms in the house. Right? So, and, and, and we cannot go with these IKEA type of beds where you just stack them and put them up. That, that doesn't work. You need to go to a place like Moratua, which specializes in beds, and build these massive, massive teak or mahogany beds. Right? So that's my pattern. So I got the forces. I had a solution. I have related patterns, patterns which can be associated patterns that make sense. And I have anti-patterns as well. Right? So those are my patterns. So now I'm taking an example, and let's go through some of these various patterns. Right? Um, let's take an example. So if you attended one of the last sessions uh, yesterday, uh, you had the wc 2 telco session, uh, where you, you have a telco stack. And you have users who are trying to authenticate to e-commerce websites, like Sri Lanka, in Sri Lanka, uh, wow.lk, mydeal.lk, so on and so forth, using your mobile device. Right? So you can log in via mobile, mobile device, and you can use SMS and USSD to actually authenticate yourself. So that's one step. But lower down the line, you basically have the telco backend systems. You have the uh, network systems. You have the USSD, the SMSC, the uh, location-based systems. You have the, the customer relationship management systems. You have the loyalty systems. So you need to track. You need to integrate to all of these, and you need to basically come up with an architecture uh, that helps you achieve this. Right. So that's that's my business architecture. This, of course, is more detailed than a business architecture, but that's my business problem. Right. So I'll go into the various uh, architecture patterns that I have selected, and uh, let's look at that. So first is a layered architecture. So if you're from a technical background, you, you've used either the Java Enterprise Edition, the, the .NET framework, uh, many other frameworks that are out there for, let's say, PHP, and so on and so forth. So you have a typical layered architecture. Right? You've got the, the presentation layer. You've got the persistence layer. You've got the storage layer. You've got a business layer. And you, you started building applications using those various layers. So it's quite easy to build. right? Uh, you, you just build a business layer. You've got the model view controller pattern, all of these patterns that basically naturally fit in there. What did that offer? It offered separation of concerns. Uh, you have the isolation of layers. right? So, so no one's going to go and mess with the presentation layer. You got the specialist UI guy who builds the wireframe. Someone then basically implements that wireframe. You got a, a tech lead who gives you interfaces. And then someone will create the uh, classes for those interfaces. Some will create the abstract classes. And then you go and build those applications. You actually build them and commit them, so on and so forth. Right? So it's a straightforward methodology there. Um, so this, this is quite easy. Uh, it's still used quite a lot. You got, it's quite easy for development. It's quite easy for testing. So if you see on the right-hand side here, I've got a small box that lists some of the trade-offs. Right? So we start with agility. So basically, if there's a change, the ability to change the, the code, the ability to change uh, according to the requirements. Development is basically the ability to build the application, or develop the application from scratch. Deployment is basically the ability to deploy the application. That's self-explanatory, sorry. Uh, test is to test the application, obviously. Perf here is performance, the performance of the overall stack and the individual components. And finally, scale means the scalability. Right? So I'll, I'll, I'll talk about that as well. So the problem here is, of course, agility is, is quite low. Right? So, so someone from business comes and says, I need to change something. And, and then you need to go find the UI guy, wake him up in the middle of the night and ask him to change one screen. Then you find someone else to change the business layer and go and change the model layer. Development is quite easy. It's straightforward. You have specialist teams doing each part, so development is easy. Deployment, very difficult again. Right? So you, you have to basically deploy various components. But it's easier than some of the other patterns. Testing is easier. Right? So because development is easier, testing is also easier. You just test each layer. Right? So that's, that's OK. Performance-wise, not too good. Right? And scalability-wise, also not too good. Right? You've got these monolithic applications kind of thing, uh, which doesn't uh, scale too well. Right? So what happened next is people started looking at the various other layers. So, so you see this layer in the middle. 
which is a services layer. So people started putting a services layer in there, or called it the middleware layer. And from that arose what is called service-oriented architecture. So, um, so you, my colleague Nadisha spoke about SOA in detail, so I'm not going to talk about it in detail. But my, my basic understanding here is that I want to have a service-oriented architecture, and I'll start off with integration, right? So I want to integrate to various backend systems. I have a, a data service layer, so I, I need to connect to like various databases, data sources. Uh, I have traditional web services. I want to build web services, so I use an application server. I use Tomcat, JBoss, or, or maybe a, a whole microservices approach, for example. Uh, I have legacy services, so I need to write a wrapper layer. So I'm using an adapter pattern in there, which is basically a design pattern brought in there. Uh, I have cloud services, so I need to be able to connect to these cloud services. So I'll use existing connectors of, of maybe the enterprise service bus. Uh, I have asynchronous services, right? so, so, I need, uh, so there's, a, there's a time lapse there. Uh, there. There needs to be guaranteed delivery, so on and so forth. So I'll use maybe a messaging system there. And within that, within the SOA pattern as a whole, I bring in other patterns. So I bring in, like Gregor Hope's enterprise integration patterns. Right? Uh, as you know, there's a full catalog of all of these patterns. So for example, I, I want to guarantee delivery. So I have a guaranteed delivery pattern. Or oh, I, I basically want to have logs without affecting the performance of the system. So I have a wiretapping or wire log pattern in there. Uh, I want to handle messages to a backend system, but make sure that they don't fail so that I can retry there. So I can have a store and forward, or I can have a dead letter channel basically operating there. Even, even at the integration side, I can do content-based routing. I can do a scatter gather. I can do uh, aggregation, so on and so forth. So different patterns at different levels. And it's quite, it's quite advantageous to use these patterns, because you're not reinventing the wheel there. You're just looking. You, you have a problem. Let's say you want to do integration, and you want to basically take one message, call multiple systems, get the response back, and then uh, go to the next sequence. So if I go into the enterprise integration pattern catalog, I already have these done. I have the sequences out there. I just have to get that code and basically put it in. Right? So, so that it, there's that advantage basically there. So I've done that. Let me go into more SOA uh, patterns. So security is actually a pattern. Within security, you have federated identity as a pattern where you call multiple systems, you trust multiple systems, you have brokered authentication, you have trusted subsystems, like you saw in the, uh, the microservice architecture as well, where you trust various systems. So you trust this core system saying that that's going to give me an authenticated user, and then you work with that. You have certificate-based authentications, so on and so forth. So again, multiple systems, uh, various services taking on various responsibilities. Similar to the identity pattern, then you've got the service registry pattern, which is one of the core components of an SOA pattern. Right? So you've got a service registry. Even in the microservices world, the whole concept of a registry, even though it's a smaller service registry, is very important. So Sagar spoke about client-side discovery and server-side discovery. Right? So you need a mechanism to store the services. You need a mechanism to pull for these services and dynamically identify when these services come online. So this concept of registry is also important when you move towards technologies like microservices. So we've got registry in there. We've got identity server in there. We've got our integration platform already in there. So we build on that. Right? So we've got a solutions architecture that's building. And let's look at this. So service-oriented architecture, agility is quite high. Right? These are different components, different teams. Yes, you can basically make changes. Relative to microservices, let, let's see later on. Developments, yes, easy. Right? You, you basically, again, have specialized teams, so that, that works for us. Deployment, quite difficult. Right? That was the, one of the core reasons why this whole microservices architecture movement came, came about. Right? So to deploy something, now I need to wait for someone to deploy the ESB sequences, someone to basically deploy my actual WAR files as services on the application server, uh, go create the APIs, and then expose it to the outside world, so on and so forth. So I need to wait for that ESB guru to basically come to work the next day to actually uh, launch this service and test it. Right? Even for testing, that's, that's basically a problem. Um, testing, again, quite difficult, because you need to now test the various components. You test the uh, various services. Individual services might be easy, but then uh, when it comes to like, the overall system, that's a bit difficult. And when something fails, then it's quite difficult, basically, to figure out 
where this failure is coming from. Right? So then you need to go down to the various levels. Scalability is high. Of course, it's an SOA system. You can scale each layer infinitely. So that, that basically works for us. OK, so, so then you've got this identity bus here, right? the identity server here. And let's look at the identity server itself. Now, within my architecture, because I'm building this telco system, I have this requirement for a microkernel architecture. So you've got the system. You're zooming into that system and trying to figure out what you can do with that system. So microkernel architecture is basically the plug-in architecture. Uh, one of the best examples is the Eclipse platform. You've got the platform itself, and then you've got the various projects. Another great example is, of course, the WSO2 Carbon platform. Right? You've got the core, and then you've got these multiple components, these multiple plugins, the OSGI-based plugins that were developed. So if you take the identity server itself, because we are talking about a specific solution here, I need various authenticators to, to achieve my use case. Right? I have users authenticating via SMS, USSD. Uh, there's a MePIN authenticator out there. There's like the normal local authenticators. There's the federated authenticators. So I need to be able to build these authenticators and hot deploy them at runtime. Right? Or, or basically, I need to have them plug, pluggable so that different customers can request various kinds of authenticators. So, so that's my authentication framework. And I can basically build like various authenticators there. So this can be considered an, a variation of a microkernel architecture. Right? So this is zooming in to my architecture. So what does that mean? Agility is, again, high because it's a plug-in architecture. Right? So if someone comes and says, now I need uh, like an NFC, a near-field communication-based authenticator. Right? So, so I can build that because that's an authenticator. And WSO2 Identity Server has an extensible authentication framework where, which allows you to build that. Right? Development is quite tricky, right? It's, you learn OSGI, you learn the various authenticated framework um, uh, components, all of that. So development is trickier compared to, like, let's say, SOA and, and something else, right? Deployment, quite easy. It's, 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 uh, maybe it's mostly it's a hot deployable thing. It's a matter of drop, dropping in a bunch of jars. Uh, maybe you have to restart the server. So deployment is OK. Testing is quite OK. You can test these components, these plugins, in isolation. You can mock the framework. You can mock the services and test them. Performance is high. It's quite close to the core system. It uses whatever native communication mechanism that the core system uses. So performance is high. But scaling out is, is a bit difficult, right? But here, scaling out is not one of the key requirements. But if you have to really scale, then microkernel architecture might not be the solution. Uh, my colleague Dustin has spoke about event-driven architecture. Right? So I've got my system now. I've got my SOA. I've got my layered architecture. I've got my microkernel architecture in place. I now need to handle devices. It's not just the users who consume this, but it's devices who continuously, asynchronously push messages into this system. Right? So the IoT scenarios, the, the M2M scenarios in the mobile world, the, the sensor networks, all of this pushing device, uh, information. In the event-driven architecture, again, I'm not going into details, but you have a mediator topology right? where you have a sequence. You get an event. You basically go through a sequence with that event. Or you have a broker topology where you get an event, you push that event out, and whoever is interested in those events basically start acting upon those events. But essentially, you have the same concepts. You have an event channel. You have an event consumer. You have an event producer, so on and so forth. Right? So let's add that in. So I've, I've got my identity. I've got my registry, service registry there. I've got my integration pass, bus pattern. Policy enforcement point is part of identity, which connects to multiple systems. I've got the, uh, the whole IoT, or event-driven architecture there. Let me use that side. So, so you can see I've got a service registry there, and, and basically the event, uh, what's that? event processor there. You've got the device gateway, which is also based on the ESB. I've uh, got the message broker, which can be used for the MQTT type communications to various devices. Uh, you've got the normal HTTP type communication via the ESB directly. All of that information would go through maybe a complex event processor, which would be uh, the, uh, which would do all of the event processing there. The events can be stored in an event store and then pushed out onto a queue so that subscribers can basically consume uh, modified versions of these events. Right? So that's my architecture there. Agility, again, quite high. Right? With event-driven architect architectures, different components, it's all based on events. Right? So it's quite easy to change. 
Development is quite difficult because you, you can't test an end-to-end -end scenario quite easily, right? You're working with message queues. You're basically putting information in queues, so you're working in isolation there, right? Deployment, high, right? It's, it's, it's easy to deploy. It's, it's much easier to deploy than an SOA environment. Uh, testing, again, low, quite difficult because you're distributing out the components. Performance, again, quite high. You're dealing with event-based systems. For example, if ActiveMQ can handle it, the complex event processor basically can handle around 300,000 transactions per second, right? So then the limiting factor is basically your event producers, your publishers, and the event queues, right? So, so performance is quite high. Scalability is quite high as well, right? OK, so with event-driven architecture, the next factor is external consumption. Now, I've, I've talked about devices pushing stuff. How do I consume this? Right? So that's where Shiro spoke about the resource-oriented architecture, and Dakshita spoke about the web-oriented architecture. So you basically plug in something that can control external access, something that can do SLAs there, it can do quality of service, it can do your throttling, your management of your APIs, and implement RESTful patterns such as HateOS, where you, you basically decouple the backend system and send the links as, as, uh, as URLs to the client application, you support URL binding, you support late binding, so on and so forth, right? And loose coupling. So I add in my API gateway layer there. I have my API store, I have my API gateway, which talks with an API facade pattern to the backend. Uh, again, same as quite similar to the, the SOA uh, trade-offs there, architectural trade-offs there. So let's skip that, right? And then the one before last is microservices architecture. Right? So Sagar spoke about this, so I'll, I'll not go into detail. But again, here, you got, since this is quite new, you got various topologies. You have this whole outer architecture, which is based on APIs. You have the outer architecture, which is basically based on application RESTful services. So the, the client basically communicates directly with applications. Or you have a system which is based on a lightweight message, messaging mechanism. Right? Bottom line is the inner architecture is what you're really concerned about. You're going to build services in a very easy way, easily deployable way, composable units, uh, micro components. The outer architecture basically can change. So let me tie that in to my overall telco architecture. Right? So I've already got an API gateway and an API store. Some of these services I want to control. I, I want full control. I'm not going to let the client decide what to call. So I plug those services through the API gateway. But I've got my service container level, which can be the MS4J, the microservices framework for Java, which can also be something else, which can be Spring Boot, which can be, be some, some other uh, microservices framework out there. So I plug that in. I also want this whole client-side discovery concept, and I also want clients to be able to consume some of the services directly as well. So I, I then deploy a service gateway there as well. So you have the direct consumption part as well. Right? So, so that's, that's nearly done. So that's, that's my architecture there. Right? So, so we had layered architecture. We had the service-oriented architecture and resource-oriented architecture. We had a small microkernel architecture in there. That's the authenticate part, part there. We had a microservices architecture there and an event-driven architecture to handle the telco M2M devices. Finally, uh, as Professor Frank Lehman, who's sitting somewhere there, mentioned, so it's cloud-based architecture, right? So, so I have all of this, and now I need to scale. I need to do elastic scaling. I need to do auto-scaling and auto-healing. Uh, I need to basically be able to monitor the performance and the load and the health of these components and basically act upon it. I need to have patterns like the watchdog there. Uh, everything should be shared, nothing, stateless components, so on and so forth, right? So, and then basically take this and deploy in a highly scalable environment. So, so that's where story, the, the concept of lightweight containers, Docker, and the various SDNs, and so on and so forth come up, right? So I can transform all of that into, uh, let's say, a Mesosphere-based, uh, Docker-based architecture. So, so we spoke about an AWS-based uh, architecture, uh, a Docker-based deployment with Kubernetes as the, the layer there. I think Shankar spoke about uh, Ubernetes sitting on top of Kubernetes. So all of those buzzwords. So this is basically an architecture which uses, let's say, Mesosphere, uh, because Mesosphere is a very, uh, very much used telco SDN nowadays. And then we see a lot of telcos basically moving in there. Right? 
So, so this is basically a native uh, Mesosphere deployment. So you have all of these containers, uh, the master container sitting there, the slave container sitting there, and you let Mesosphere and, and the Marathon and so on and so forth handle that uh, scaling layer there. So that's my cloud-based architecture. So when it comes to cloud, again, agility is quite high. Development, quite difficult, right, in a cloud-based environment. But the rule of thumb is that you shouldn't worry about how, where it's deployed, right? So, so that, that basically brings us back to a different problem. Deployment, it's easy. You, you basically scale out, right? So you, you're relying on various containers, and these containers would continuously scale out. So you don't have, as a developer, you don't have to worry about these things. Uh, testing, quite difficult, right? Because again, very distributed up there. Performance is very, very high, right? You can infinitely scale. You have smaller containers. It's much more faster than your normal VM model. But then the VM can also fit into this whole cloud-based architecture. You can scale up and scale down without having that requirement of having like uh, minimal instances, so on and so forth, right? Uh, and, and so performance. And then scalability is also very, very high. So, so that's, that's basically what I wanted to talk about, right? I think, yes, I'm right on time. Uh, so what we spoke about is basically we started off with what a pattern is. Uh, the example should be quite vivid so that you should remember what a pattern is in the future, right? Uh, go home, look at your bedroom, and figure it out. Right. Then the second part is we looked at a layered architecture. We looked at service-oriented architecture, resource-oriented architecture, event-driven architecture, microservices and microkernel architectures, and then finally uh, moving on to cloud architectures. Uh, I couldn't come up with a summary, so I basically put this. But uh, it's quite similar to architecture as well, right, uh, as architects. So if this is the case for programmers, imagine what it is for architects. Then you might be the, the family planning council or something, and they said, you told me to have two kids. That's better, right? So, Niroshias, put your glasses on. Read that. OK. Um, thank you very much. <laughs>